Chapter 19, Part 2, Liquids. Does it sink or does it float? Sinking and floating can be summed up in three simple rules. Number one, if it's more dense than the fluid it's in, it will sink. So more dense, it sinks. Number two, if it's less dense, it floats. Number three, if it's the same density, then it will neither sink nor float. So the buoyant force depends on, on an object's volume, right? The amount of water it displaces, the weight of that water is our buoyant force. All right, so a smaller object displaces less water, so a smaller buoyant force acts on it. Whereas a larger object displaces more water, so a larger buoyant force acts on it. The submerged object's volume and not its weight determines the buoyant force. The weight determines whether it sinks or floats, but the buoyant force is determined by volume. So, if an object sinks or floats, it depends on its buoyant force and weight. When the buoyant force exactly equals the weight, then the object's weight must equal the weight of the displaced water. And, since the volumes of the object and the displaced water are the same, since the weights are equal, that means that their volumes are the same, so the density of the object must be the same as the density of water. Therefore, it would neither float nor sink. All right, so here the wood floats. It's less dense than water. So same volume as the water it displaces, but it has less mass, so a smaller weight, so it floats. Uh, the rock sinks because it is more dense than water. Same volume as the amount of water it displaces, However, it's more dense, so it has a larger weight than the water, so it sinks. So that it is greater than the buoyant force. And then the fish neither rises nor sinks because it has the same density as water. And the fish is at one. There, its density equals that density of the water. If it were able to bloat itself up, it would be less dense and would float. And if it swallowed a stone, it would sink. So the density of a submarine is controlled similarly. It takes in water, takes out water. So um, the fish does the same thing, it takes in air or gives off air in order to change its volume, to change its density, to describe whether it wants to float or sink. A crocodile does the same. It swallows stones to swim lower and expose itself less. There you go, you got two crocodiles. The crocodile on the right is more dense because it's full of stones. So, if the fish makes itself more dense, it will sink. If it makes itself less dense, it will rise. In terms of buoyant force, why is this so? Well, when the fish increases its density by decreasing its volume, it displaces less water. So, it gives off some air, takes up less space, becomes more dense, same amount, uh, a smaller amount of stuff in a smaller space, so less dense, um, then the buoyant force is less. So it will um, all right and then when the fish decreases its density by expanding it displaces more water and the buoyant force increases. So that's just the buoyant force increasing and decreasing depending on the volume of the fish. So more dense it sinks, less dense it rises. What are our three rules? If it's more dense, it sinks, less dense, it floats, and same density, it neither floats nor sinks. Flotation. The principle of flotation states that a floating object displaces a weight of fluid equal to its own weight. So in order to float, to, neither, um, to stay on top, you have to displace, take up the amount of space of fluid that's equal to its own weight. So how does a really heavy ship float? Well, iron is nearly eight times as dense as water. So if you get a big block of iron, um, a one ton block of iron will only displace one eighth of a ton of water. So the buoyant force will be one eighth the weight of the block of iron. So not nearly enough to keep it from sinking. But let's say you reshape it. Take that iron block and turn it into a bowl. You put the bowl into a body of water, it displaces a greater volume of water. So a larger volume of water, and as long as it displaces a volume of water that weighs one ton, 
then it will float. Once the buoyant force equals the weight. Solid iron block sinks, same block shape to occupy eight times as much volume floats. So the amount of volume it has to take up is uh, directly proportional to the weight ratio. A floating object displaces a weight of liquid equal to its own weight. So here this weighs the same, this weighs the same, but this water, this amount of liquid, weighs the same as the weight of the block. All right, so for a ship to float, it needs to displace an amount of water equal to its own weight. So a 10,000 ton ship needs to displace 10,000 tons of water before it sinks too deep below the surface and takes on water. So you can't build a super skinny ship um, that weighs 10,000 tons because it's not going to displace enough water. That's why big ships are really wide. All right, the weight of the floating canoe equals the weight of the water displaced by the submerged part of the canoe. It floats lower in the water when it's loaded. Add more weight to it, it now has to displace more water. See, it's taking up a lot more water than it was before. All right, for the ship, shown empty and loaded. The weight of the ship's load equals the weight of the extra water displaced. So the extra water taken up here weighs the same as the cargo and people and whatever else may be on board. Okay, a submarine, if it displaces water greater than its own weight, it's going to rise. If it displaces less, it will go down. And if it displaces exactly its weight, it will remain at constant depth. That's how submarines work. Also, water has slightly different densities with different temperatures, so it has to make adjustments. It's not a perfect science. Principle of flotation, you have to displace the same amount of water, same weight of water, as your weight in order to float. So when you're floating in the pool, you have to displace the same weight of water as you weigh. So that's why laying on your back you can float, but you make a cannonball shape and you're going to sink. Alright, Pascal's principle. It's kind of an odd one. Pascal's principle states that changes in pressure at any point in an enclosed fluid at rest are transmitted undiminished, that just means unchanged, they don't get less strong, to all points in the fluid and act in all directions. So you make a change in pressure anywhere in the fluid, it goes all throughout the fluid and acts every way. So if the pressure of city water is increased at the pumping station by 10 units, the pressure everywhere will be increased by 10 units. Pascal's principle describes how changes are transmitted. So a big example for Pascal's principle is a U-shaped tube. So you fill a U-shaped tube, put pistons at each end, so things that are sitting on top of the water at either end. You put pressure on the left piston, it's going to go all throughout the liquid and hit the right piston. So the pressure the left piston exerts against the water will be exactly equal to the pressure the water exerts against the right pistons. Put force there, and you get a same force there, because it goes all throughout the water and up there. All right, a one newton load on the left piston will support 50 newtons on the right piston. This is a one newton load on this area, and so it's distributed, distributed, then one newton, one newton, one newton, one newton for every section of this, so it adds up to 50 newtons because this is 50 times the surface area. All right, the piston on the left had an area of one centimeter squared, and the right has an area 50 times as great, 50 centimeters squared. So that one newton load gives you an additional pressure of one newton per square centimeter, and that's transmitted all throughout. So that additional pressure is exerted against every single square centimeter, so that's how you end up with the 50 newton load it can support. Using that, you can multiply forces. One newton input, 50 newtons output. By further increasing the area, you can multiply forces even more. Okay, but here's the catch. Even though you get an increase in force, you get a decrease in distance movement. 
So the small piston, you move it downward by 10 centimeters. The large piston is only going to go up by 1 50th of that. So it will only move up by 0.2 centimeters. Okay, so you compensate. Is it the force, the amount of load you want it to support, or is it the distance you want it to move? So the input force multiplied by the distance it moves is equal to the output force multiplied by the distance it moves. Okay, so input times the distance equals the output force, the amount of force times the distance. So the 1 and the 50. All right, so for example, an automobile lift in a service station is an application. Low pressure over a large area produces a large force. So here's a small area, and here's a large area. Small pressure on this large area gives us a large force on this small area. So that's all it's talking about. The compressor supplies pressure to the reservoir and then that's transmitted through the oil. So, as the car is being lifted, how does the change in oil level in the reservoir compare with the distance the automobile moves? What do you think? How's the distance going to change? Alright, the car is going to move up a greater distance than the oil level drops since the surface area of the piston is smaller than the surface area of the oil. So this is the smaller surface area, this is a larger surface area. Less distance change, more distance change. So Pascal's principle is that even distribution of force within a liquid. You put in one force on one side and it outputs the same force on the other side in the, over the same surface area. So that's it.